Good morning. I'm so glad that y'all are here today as we celebrate Christ. Today as we come, I want you to remember tonight, tonight is the Wild Beast Feast. I'm telling you, it's Miss Sandra Steele's favorite time of the year. She loves wild game. Just want you to know. Ain't that right, Miss Sandra? Don't you love all them coons and possums and everything? <laughs> Absolutely not. So anyway, I'm just going to tell you, I got some good coon. I'm just telling you, I'm bringing some of the best coon I've ever cooked tonight. So I expect y'all all to dig into it. It's really prime looking and stuff. Just give it a little try. It's all corn fed because it come off y'all's deer feeders and stuff like that. But uh, tonight's just a wonderful opportunity for you to be able to invite somebody just to come and, and be with brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I want you to remember it's not so much about the eating, it's about the reaching. You know, the most important thing we can do as the, the body of Christ is to reach people with the gospel message. And you can't reach them if you don't ever have a chance to speak to them. So uh, get out there and invite somebody tonight. And also, uh, I want you to look on, on your bulletins. It says uh, every night at 8 o'clock. We was talking about this just the other night. Uh, Miss Angie had brought this up. And uh, every night at 8 o'clock, they're asking us to pray for one minute. Now, I know everybody has a busy schedule. Everybody has a busy schedule, right? So, now, most of y'all got them things called smartphones. Not all, everybody. But most people have what's called a smartphone. Your smartphone can be set to one-minute prayer. Take the time and pray for one minute. Pray for your president. Pray for your country. Now, I want you to think about what everything you see, you, you see it on TV and all your Fox News and everything, and how much you've been griping. I want you to think about all your griping. So with all your griping, take 60 seconds and pray. Because God is able to do great things. And if it's just a remnant, we'll pray. If just, he says, if my people, which are called by my name, will repent. Seek his face. He says, I'll come in, I'll heal your land. I don't know about you, but we need a healing in the land. So the number one cause of death in the United States is what, y'all? Abortion in the United States. That's the number one. I want you to know these figures and stuff, and I want you to understand that we need a repentive state, that we see life as important as we see just the, the values of your forefathers who've went, and many of you go back a long time in this nation, and um, over here, I was saying over here at Zion Hill, there's graves out there that come from um, the, the Revolutionary War where they were given land grants after fighting for the independence of the United States. I find history amazing to me. I didn't know this was up here. It ought to be a historic landmark, to be honest with you. But you'll see that. Your, your ancestors fought all the way back in the history for the freedoms that you get to enjoy. Freedoms did not come free. It came by the shedding of blood. Your freedom as a born-again believer came by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, also, tomorrow night is going to be the brotherhood thing, so that's going to be at Thompson's Creek, right? Is that on here? I'm sure it is. Uh, tomorrow night, right? What time are we leaving here? 6.15, we're leaving here. Uh, so at Thompson's Creek, they serve barbecued chicken. In case you want to know, men, what's going to be on the menu and stuff. Uh, they're, they're known for their chicken and stuff, so it's a great time. Also, I want you to remember Brother Ellis, uh, for the month of March, he's going to be preaching at First Baptist of Butte. Their, their pastor, I believe today is his last day of uh, ministry over there, and he's going to be going to Brandon. So uh, keep Brother Ellis in prayer as he goes and serves the Lord over there uh, for the month of March at least. And uh, just pray a hedge about him. Also, uh, Brother Dave is going to be having a heart cath in the morning. Brother Dave is, is, is having a, um, they, he has a uh, aortic valve that they're looking at with the possibility uh, of, of even doing an open heart tomorrow. It depends on what they find. But they're definitely going to be setting him up for uh, surgery uh, later for this valve. It just depends on what they find tomorrow. So uh, we don't know exactly what time. He's scheduled to be there at 7 o'clock tomorrow in, in uh, St. Dominic's. So I want you to be praying for Brother Dave. And uh, we're going to pray right now in the name of Jesus. Also, my dad fell in the tub a while ago. He wasn't injured. He slipped a little bit, but he's, he's okay. And uh, um, it's, it's just keep my dad and mom in your prayers. 
uh, we, we covet your prayers. But let's lift Brother Dave up and uh, let's pray for him in the name of Jesus. Maybe a couple men would come around here and gather around Brother Dave. I got a couple guys that come pray for Brother Dave with me. Anybody? Any deacons here? All right, where we go? Brother Ellis going to join over here. Let's go. Brother West, just, just a couple of you will be good. Just any of you people to come up and just, I want you to just gather around our brother in Christ. And uh, let's pray for him in the name of Jesus. As he's going to be there in the morning. The leadership of God as they do this procedure. So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that we can come together as the body of Christ today, Lord, seeking your face and knowing, Lord, that the one who created us cares about us and is involved in our lives, that we weren't set out here just, just on some kind of traveling thing, Father, just going out there, just spinning off. But, Lord, you have a plan for our lives. Lord, uh, our brother in Christ, Lord, is, is having a procedure done. And, Lord, they've talked about his valve having troubles, Lord, and different things. They're going to be looking for blockage. But, Lord, we come to you today, Father, and we pray for the miraculous. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus that they'll find those veins open. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus. We submit to your will, Lord. And we know you've got plans beyond our imaginations. But we're asking God for your touch upon him. We ask, God, that you guide the doctors, every part of the procedure. Everything that they do, Lord, will be led by you. We pray in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit will give Brother Dave and his family comfort and peace at this moment. That, Lord, they just feel your love and care, Father, right there with them. As he has friends that's going to be traveling with him, Father. We pray, Lord, this procedure will go better than what anyone would even dream of or expect, God. And we pray for his divine healing, Father. Lord, however you see fit. We ask, God, that, Lord, as this man who has, Lord, given his talents and abilities to lift the name of Jesus Christ for all these years... Lord, that you would keep him safe from all harm, Father. And that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that he'll have the opportunity to use this as a witnessing tool for those who surround him, Father. For, Lord, without you, where would we be? No hope, no Savior, no salvation. Lord, no forgiveness, Father. And, Lord, no future, Father. But through you, God, Lord, we lay all our heart at your feet, Lord, all our soul at your feet, everything that we possess. And we, Father, we claim the victory in the name of Jesus Christ. Bless these people that are here today, for we've come to celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all join in our worship service this morning as we sing praises to the Lord. This first song is Love, Love is the Theme. Let's stand together as we sing.
prayer. Oh, what a glorious day, Lord. Lord, a day that you've created. And what a glorious time, Lord, that we can come in your house, Lord, to give you praise and give you honor and glory for all that you do. Help us, Lord, that we'll never find ourselves just taking all this for granted. But, God, we depend upon you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would meet with us today. God, that each one of us would come in a, hum in a humble way this morning, Lord, with a heart seeking you, Lord. God, asking for a word. God, asking for a song, Lord. Asking you to stir our hearts, Lord. God, in the day and the time we live in, Lord, it's, no, it's such a great time, Lord, that we can come to you, Lord, and for the comfort and the peace that only you give. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll be with every part of this service this morning, Lord, that you would have your way. Lord, that it would be directed to you, Lord, that you would receive the honor and the glory for it, Lord. God, just help us in a mighty way. Be with those that are sick and suffering, Lord. We have many throughout the church. Lord, we ask you to touch them, Lord, in a mighty way. We ask you to be with those families that's lost loved ones out across the land this week, Lord. God, lift them up and strengthen them, Lord, and encourage them, Lord, through your hope and through your promise that you give. Father, go with us and lead and guide and direct us, Lord. Help us, Lord, that you would find us doing the things you've called us to do, to be those people you've called us to be, Lord God. And we just thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, this next song is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. <laughs> Great message in that song, isn't it? Amen. Praising my Savior all the day long. All right, this next one is Ring the Bells of Heaven. Be our offertory hymn. Let's stand together again as we sing. <laughs>
Thank you, Liz.
just over in the glory land. It'll be a great, great day, isn't it? I'm going to sing a song for you this morning. That I don't know how God could come and could send his only begotten son to come and die for us, old sinners. But he did, didn't he? He came and took our place so that we can go f free. Listen to the words of this song. <laughs> not 
fit to kill than a man on the cross but me in his will and said that I could still go free still go free. Yeah. Oh, uh, we don't have anybody to teach Children's Church today, Brother Charlie. Um, I appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Our individual that was doing it, uh, all the family got sick, so we don't have anybody here, unless somebody wanted to jump up and volunteer and teach, but um, we don't have anybody here today. At one of those rare occasions, <sighs> that flu has been wiping them out around here. If you'll open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, let's look at verses 11 through 20. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 20. If you can stand with me as we read God's Word today. Now most of y'all are going to have this memorized. And he says, the man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided the wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, and he went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger? I will get up. I will go to my father. And will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Yes, you use that as our verses today. Father... We thank you so much that we can gather together in your house, Lord, and just seek your face to read your word, Lord, to pray and know that, God, that you hear us, that you're concerned about what's going on in our lives, Father, and what's taking place around us. Father, we lift up our country to you today, God, and we ask for wisdom as, Lord, tomorrow they're, they're voting on this uh, bill on, on, on whether a child that has been aborted, comes out of the womb, has, a, has a, a, the right to survive. Lord, Help us. Help our nation, Father. Forgive us of our wickedness, of our sin, the wretched feeling that life doesn't matter and it's less it's just that individual's. Lord, take away the selfish heart that we have acquired through generations of prosperity. Help us, Father, see that, Lord, our whole need is wrapped up in you. And, Lord, may our spirit be open to your leadership, that the Holy Spirit would guide us in all the things that we do and all the things that we say. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, ma'am. Oh, there we go. We, we'll, have, we'll have children's church because Jessica is prepared. Come on, my youngins, my darlings. Now, look how many of them come. Now, watch. That's the great thing with people that's volunteering. Thank y'all so much. Uh, it, it helps. There's a great need. And this is actually a smaller crowd than what we we're, we're usually run actually from 15 to 18 every single Sunday. So there's a great need. Matter of fact, it kind of reminds me right here. Uh, you know, one of the greatest things as a minister is being able to listen to the children as they learn the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I don't, have you ever taken the time to listen to your children as they come back and they start 
uh, telling you what they learned. And I remember years ago, uh, this particular verse here was in one of our vacation Bible school. This was years ago. And one of the children came back and started telling me about this story. And then they started telling me about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did upon the cross for us. And that how he'll accept us and welcome us back. You know what? When they were telling me that story, it brought me into remembering what one of my little elementary uh, Sunday school teachers taught me. And I brought up her name, but I want you to think. So it, this makes the difference. Miss Holman. Miss Holman was there, and, and she would give silver dollars out if you would memorize a scripture verse every week. She'd give you a dollar. Now, a dollar back there in the 1970s was quite a bit of money, especially with a silver dollar. You know how many I got in all those time in her class? None. Now, y'all know I'm kind of frugal and everything. Never would learn it. I never would memorize it. Now, I had my daddy there and mama there all the time. They prayed with me and read the Bible. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord through all my going of the other direction. God never turned his back on me. You know, the b great blessing is, uh, I, know, I hope you ask your children, because I know Jessica's pinch hitting today, and I don't know what she's going to be doing, but I know it's going to be something to do with Jesus Christ. You know, it makes such a difference. When I was in there, and I, I remember learning that same story that those children had learned in vacation Bible school, and we used to use felt boards. Any of you ever use a felt board in Sunday school? Well, we used to have these felt boards, and I remember seeing that felt board. I, I had one in Missouri. A lady was still using it also. And I, <laughs> when I was a kid, I remember it seemed so far in my, my imagery as a child between the father and that man right there, that, the guy who had went off and ran away from where he should be. It, it's amazing to me how that sticks with me this many years later, the message of Jesus Christ. You know, I'd read a story recently about how they had these triplets, and, and these triplets were separated at birth, and they were all given away for, for adoption. Thank you, Jesus, they didn't abort them. And these children, years later, had friends that told them, said, listen, I know somebody who looks just like you. They were triplets. I know somebody who looks exactly like you, and their friends got them together, and they found out, and they were so excited to find out that they had something in common, and they met, and they discovered that they were brothers Right there, and they never even knew it. Have you ever read the Bible, and as you're looking through the Bible stories, you start seeing reflections of people that you're actually kin to? You ever see the Bible stories, and you start seeing how this really is something that speaks to me? Now, while I read this particular scripture, a lot of people don't feel akin to it because they don't feel like they've ever left their land or, or went away from, uh, you know, their, their inherit. maybe they've never had an inheritance or something like that. Maybe they felt like they've never left because a lot of people don't live, left, leave where they've grown up at. Most of you have generations that your families have grown up right here in Mississippi where just like where I'm from in Livingston Parish, Louisiana, you know, all my family lives right there in a cluster. They're either in the town of Livingston or they're in Albany out there and they're, they're all gathered around. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of all my, my folks that I'm kin to. I, I have a few that I'm kin to up here even. But you know what? Most of them stay right there. They've inherited their land. They've inherited their properties. And they have these roots that go really deep. So when I read these stories sometimes, people don't feel like they've ever done anything like this. They've never squandered their money. They've never wasted it. They've never hung out with people with low morals. So they can't relate to this, they feel like, because they haven't been in skid row like what they read right here. They haven't done these things. But a lot of times when you look at this, you can see that it kind of speaks to us because if you've been lost, you've been in a far country. If you've been away from where God wants you to be at, you're in a far country. When you look at these scriptures right here, we find that the far country is any place that's one step away from where God wants you to be at. Now, you might be sitting here in the church today, and you definitely don't feel like you're in a far country but I'm going to tell you something. If you're not doing what God has called you to do, you're in a distant place. You're in a place that's in the opposite of where God wants you to be at. See, the, the far countries, it's marked with this attitude of that I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and exactly it's going to be my way. It's a selfish kind of spirit. It's a spirit that comes up that I'm never going to do because I've given before. It, it's my time to receive right here. All of this, is, it's all located in a, a self-interest of being, it's all about me. Everything's defined by me. Everything I want, how I want it done, I'm the reason for it. And that's that place where we start stepping away from where God wants us to be at. 
It, it says the difference between the terms of giving and having and taking. It's all that difference of, of how we look at things in life. Now, the elder brother in this particular scripture right here, he was living with the father in the same exact zip code location right there, but he was actually living in a far country because when you start reading about his attitude, you see that his heart was not right with what the father would have him to do. The far country is located right here. It's right here in the inside of your heart. And it's when it comes to that point where we don't trust God's will, God's direction, and God's plan for our lives, our marriages, whatever we're doing, is when we start drifting out into a far country. It's not whether you, you're out there in a, a location in another state, because I've lived all over the country. But the thing is, it's whether your heart is separated from the Father. I, I, you know, you have to look at your life, and you have to look at yourself and say, am, am I away from where I should be? Uh, you can be in a location this far away and not even be aware of it. Even though you might be sitting right here, we can have that, that younger son's kind of attitude right there. It says in Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, look at verse 12. Luke chapter 15, look at verse 12 right there. Luke chapter 15, verse 12, it says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. See, a lot of times when we're out here, what we're doing is we're saying, you know what, I don't care what God's plan is for me. I'm telling you, drop dead. When people are out there and they're not doing, and all they see is me, myself, and I, and I want what I want, and I want it right now, I'm going to live my own life for my own purpose with my own plan. What you're actually saying is, I want to be free. I want to be free from what we consider, people consider bondage right there. To go where I want, do what I want, when I want. Let me tell you something. It's not just God calling pastors to other places. The pastor in Bude was called out there to Brandon, the pastor over here. And Gloucester was called to another location. It wasn't because they were in trouble. It wasn't because they were having a lot of problems. It's because God had a calling on their lives. But here's what we got to see. God doesn't have just a calling on the pastor's life. He's got a calling on your life. And if you're a child of the father you're a child of the king himself then god has a plan for you to get busy doing what you're supposed to be doing so what are you supposed to be doing well brother blaine i'm so busy working i'm so busy doing all these things here's the thing when we're so busy doing everything else except what god has for us you're too busy and what has happened is your priorities have been perversed you have perversed all of God's calling in your life to deliver the message of salvation to somebody, to go and minister to the needs. There's lots of people who have been ordained into positions, but I'm going to tell you something. Each one of you have been ordained to the position of called ministry as a born-again believer. And uh, what we're doing is we're out here, we're saying, Lord, I, I, I just have so much that I need to do because I have so many bills and so many responsibilities. I'm telling you, when our eyes are on the temporal, this young fellow right here was looking for his pleasure. And he said, well, I'm not looking for pleasure right now. Well, here's the deal. What are you doing for the call of ministry for Jesus Christ? What exactly have you been doing yourself uh, other than what, just what you enjoy but the labor of the field for the call of the master. Sometimes we say, Lord, I, I, just, I just want to have my position. And so we have our positions in our homes, and, and we have positions on football teams or baseball teams, or we have positions in the band, we have positions in, in businesses. But a lot of times all we're looking to is what we get out of it. God puts you in a place where you're at, no matter where the location is, for a purpose. And a lot of times we don't accept that responsibility of our calling that we're the missionary on that particular field. And what we're doing is we're identifying as a twin to the brother or the sister of the younger brother. See, it's not just a male thing, so don't just get caught up with just being the, the guys right here. It can be male or female. And a lot of times we're out here, we're saying, Lord, I, I, I just have so much I have to do. And, and, and Lord, I just want to be popular. You know, a lot of times in life, who remembers the school hams, you know, the, the, the class clown that just wanted to cut up? So many people want to be that individual who's just clowning out there. 
And we want to live in the spotlight where all it does is shine upon our stardom because we, uh, we hunger for the acceptance of everybody around us. So we never take the time to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done in our lives. We don't look at it as a responsibility because all I want is this guy or this gal to approve of who I am. I want to be just like they are. See, they should be wanting to be like you are. But you see so much more freedom in where they're at. All you see is what they're doing and how they're doing it, and that's the location you want to be. That's the same thing this guy wanted. He saw, he thought it was so great over there. He thought it was so wonderful over there. And he was saying, you know, Lord, just give me, Daddy, give me my treasure now. Just give it to me right now. See, a lot of times what we do is we measure success in terms of the things. And, and you know, one of the popular things now is people say, you know, the, the person who dies with the most toys wins. No, you just die with stuff. And before you even get the casket closed, there's going to be people hauling your stuff off. Your stuff's not going to matter. It's the relationship with Jesus Christ. A lot of times, we're not even aware that we're after the stuff. But look at it. Look at it. Who have you shared Jesus with? Who have you taken the moment to share Jesus with? Well, that's not because I'm bad. I'm not saying you're bad. I'm saying you're in a distant land, not being where God wants you to be at. See, we can find ourselves in these locations and, because we're trying to achieve what everybody says we need to be. And it goes, it starts all the way in elementary school. We start our children in elementary school and we put them in the pageants. And it's not a bad thing, is it? Because we want them to be the most beautiful. We want them to be the most successful. They're our kids, aren't they? We want them to be the best on the football team. We want them to be the best in the band. We want them to be the best in the baseball team. We want them to be the best at the rodeo. We want them to be the best. But do you want them to be the best in Jesus Christ? Do you want them to be the best born-again believer they can be? See, we don't look at that. We think it's success if they just get a little wet. God doesn't want you just wading out. He wants you to get covered up with the Holy Spirit so that your service will be a fire. A fire that burns hot. Not someone lukewarm. Not someone who's just playing the church thing. He wants you sold out. You know why the reason the country is lost is because the born-again believers are so busy. We're so busy achieving. But what of this stuff that you're achieving is going to carry on into heaven with you? Sometimes we say, Lord, I just, I just want just a little bit of religion, Lord. Just a little bit of religion. And we just say, well, we, we just want just enough to be forgiven. Yet we don't take the time to forgive somebody else. We don't take the time to say, I forgive them. We carry these baggages over with us because we're in a far country. We're in a country that's cold. We're in a country that's distant. See, we, we don't take the time to say, Lord, I'm asking for your leadership in my home and my family. Let me ask you, with everything you went through this week, what did you pray about? What did you seek the Spirit of God to lead you in? Did you even pray over your meals? Did you even read the Bible this week? Did you let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart? If he did, then you would have gotten led to do certain things. You would have been led to minister in certain ways. You would have been out there doing certain things. See, sometimes we only ask God to lead us when it involves, it's kind of funny, money situations. Lord, I'm just asking that I can get this raise, Lord. Please, Lord. I'm just asking for this truck, God. If I can just get this truck, God, get this horse, get this mule, get this cow, get this house, get this stuff. But here's the thing. We're not praying for God to make us more righteous. Right with him. To be righteous. To seek his face. To let the Holy Spirit convict us of our faults. See, a lot of times... We're asking for the protection without thinking of God's purpose in what he's doing in our lives. You know, I don't know what everything that's going on. Uh, you know, my dad has health issues. 
God has a purpose. There's a plan in there. Maybe it's one of these people who's coming to his house that we're supposed to share the gospel message with. That might be simplified to you. But see, that's the deeper theology of understanding that when God's plans are perfect, that he plans to bless us, not just financially. He's going to take care of the situation. He didn't say it wasn't going to be some thorns in the middle of all those roses. What he said was that he would never desert us or leave us by ourselves. So no matter the circumstances of what you're going through, God has a plan for it to use for his glory. See, all our lives are supposed to be glorifying and pointing to Jesus Christ. Brother Raymond Sohn, what kind of man? What kind of man would die for somebody like me? The one who deserves all our attention. The one who deserves all our worship. See, sometimes we're just saying, Lord, I just want to get to heaven. If I can just get to heaven with some smoke on my clothes, I'm going to be all right. See, you've got a problem. The problem is, it's lukewarm. It's the truth. It's lukewarmness. But see, our calling is not just to get to heaven, but to lead others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Christ, to, to lead them to understand the grace of God is open to all. God extends this grace to us, and he extends it to the, all the people who surround us out here. You ever pick cotton? Any of you ever pick cotton? So when you pick cotton, right, that's easy, ain't it? Some of y'all pick cotton. Some of you pick cotton. I don't know, Raymond looks like a cotton picker. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> you picked a bunch, right? And you pick that cotton. That was easy, wasn't it? You didn't get no scratches on your hand. It's just so gentle. You get out there. You, you never get a scratch. You never get sweaty. You never get dirty. You never have no... See, those, those cotton things that you reach into have thorns and stickers all the way around them. But you knew you had a job to do. It was your family who was dependent upon you. You had a calling and I'm sure reaching up in those cotton bo uh, bowls, is what they're called, cotton bowls, and, and, and taking that out wasn't your plan for the day because you want to go see Miss Sandra or some other girl or something like that. You want to go see somebody. You want to go do something, but you had a responsibility. See, each of us has the responsibility to go with the message of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you might get a little cut up. Sometimes you might get out there and get a little sweaty. But you know what? We should be givers and not parasites. So what's a parasite do? All right, for all y'all don't know what a parasite is, I'm breaking down redneck terms. Ticks. You ever see a big tick on a hound's ear? One that gets about that big? I know, I'm grossing you out. What do they do? They're blood suckers. See, it's not about just getting, getting, getting. It's about giving. See, that's the difference. A parasite takes. But someone that's a giver makes a difference. See, there's so many disappointments when you live in this place that's, where, that's away from where God wants you to be at. When you live in a self-centered life, it doesn't lift you to the highest potential that God has for you. It doesn't lift you to those higher locations. You can sing all the spiritual songs, but your spirit will not be risen to where God wants it to be. You'll just get the hackles up on the back of your neck every now and then. See, God wants to bless you in so many ways. He wants to place you in this position of dignity. We live in this human family. And all around here, it, it amazes me that we actually debate whether somebody's alive or not because they're still breathing outside of the womb. What kind of insanity is this? Because we live in a time of self-centered. We don't honor God with our lives, our homes, and our finances. And you know what? All we do is seek to do what we want, how we want, when we want. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to be shocked at heaven. You're going to be shocked. You know, we all joke and we kid about different things. But you're going to worship God for a thousand years, and you're not even going to notice it. I'm telling you something. As a born-again believer, 
Don't wait for tomorrow. We need to start serving the master and glorifying his name, lifting his name up on high right here and right now. What's our chief purpose of our lives? If you claim to be a born-again believer, and you truly are, your life should be honoring to God. And you should be serving the master. Serving him. Not yourself. Not just your family. Serving the master. Sometimes it may not be comfortable for you. You might be giving up things so that God's name will be honored and glorified in ways just because you feel the Spirit leading you to. Only what we do for God has any kind of significance. That's the things that builds up the treasures in heaven. You might have money coming out to your ears. You might live in the biggest house and have all sorts of land. But I'm going to tell you something. Ain't none of that going to have no recognition in heaven. What's going to have recognition in heaven is the things that you do right here, right now, to glorify God. It's amazing sometimes, and uh, I have a weird habit sometimes, that you'll see me as I do funerals. I walk through graveyards, and I read stones. Any of y'all ever read the stones? I, I preached a sermon one time. What do you want your tombstone to say? There used to be a commercial like that. What do you want wrote on your tombstone, right? But you know what? Throughout the years, I've seen some tombstones that left messages of Christ. And I figure somebody who was bold enough to leave it now, then, right now, that still affects me a hundred years later, I'm still reading what's a message that they left about what Christ has done in their lives. Not just the same old verses and stuff. They left messages. As I am, you will be. And it makes you think. Because one of these days, if the rapture don't take place, if the Lord tarries, you're going to be out there. Maybe on this side, maybe down here, maybe one of these other graveyards around here. But if you know Jesus Christ, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. And when you're present with the Lord, let me tell you something. You're going to receive your just rewards. What is your just reward? Jesus Christ paid the price for you on Calvary. His blood was shed. He paid your debt. Now let me ask you, what are you doing with your time to glorify the master? See, if we do things that don't benefit other people, it's one thing to benefit me, myself, and I, but what are you doing that benefits someone else? Sometimes, whether it's intentional or unintentional, we hinder the spread of the gospel message. Sometimes we hinder the ministry, maybe unintentional. It, and it prevents people from hearing the message of Christ. What God wants them to be, how God wants them to serve. Living a self-centered life leads to a famine of the soul. It leads to a hungering within you. I'm telling you, look at your life right now. Forget I'm a preacher. Yes, just call me cousin Billy Bob. And Billy Bob wants to talk to you. If I come to your life and you claim to be a born-again believer, what have you done for the Savior? You know, the old preacher said, you want to know who people really serve? Check, they used to say checkbook, but nobody uses a checkbook anymore. They all use debit cards. And that makes a little bit of sense. You're finding, do you tithe? And, and, and so you expect that from preachers. You expect me to talk about that. But where is your service located at? If you focus your attention on yourself, on just achieving what you consider to be success, or what you consider to be popular, or what you consider to be the ultimate position, you, you may enjoy a whole lot of time in this world with all this worldly pleasures. But one day, you're going to receive those just rewards. And it says that we're going to cast the crowns, the jewels, at the feet of Jesus Christ. Now, how would you like to go up there with a quartz? Well, this is all I got, Lord, is a quartz. Found it on the creek bank right down there at Wade Rock. You see, my life is a life of calling, not as a pastor, but as a child of the king. Living the self-centered life, it, it leads to this crushing slavery. And those, what happens is you become a slave to your appetite. It could be 
uh, an, your, your appetite could be towards the ambitions of things and stuff. And we become possessed by the possessions. You ever hear somebody say, man, I just I got so many. You know, I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I got so many bills. Well, let me ask you, who created the bills, guys? You know, I, I, it's one thing to have a car, so I can have a car. We've got to have transportation, but I could have a Porsche. Uh, that won't work good here. I better use I could have a brand spanking new four-wheel drive diesel truck, brand spanking new. What they run right now? About 70, something like that, 70,000. Who would ever thought they charge a house price for a truck? Or you could have another truck that pull, does the same thing, but it's not as popular. You see, we, we get this stuff, and we, we want people to say, look at your stuff. Let me tell you something. That's when it becomes ownership of me, when I have to just do it. Now, listen, everybody's going to have bills, but we create bills. We become uh, uh, possessed and oppressed by the possessions that we're trying to get out here, get this stuff rather than being the good steward of what God's given us, of all the things we come in contact with. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Money will slide through your fingertips. But if you are a born-again believer, you understand that God's blessed you with it, and it should be something that you're a good steward of, taking care of, and maintaining properly. So how do you get away from all this far country? How do you come back home? Uh, so this so-called prodigal son, he, he, so he, was, he would be considered stupid. He was ungrateful. He was selfish. He was immature in his life actions. And he did things that were self-destructive. We can see it uh, throughout the scriptures. But the thing that I noticed that everybody should see to his own credit is he didn't stay the fool. See, what the problem is in our society is people stay in the same position. Brother Blaine, this hurts when I do this. Stop! Just don't do it. Isn't it funny you've got to tell somebody to do that? But see, we get out into this far country, and you have a choice of staying rooted right there or coming home. Going and doing these things that keep you hungry, that keep you lonely, that keep you in desolation, or come home. See, that's what the Father does. That's what the whole sermon is, is the Father waiting on the son, the child, to come home. See, this guy recognized his mistakes. He knew he had took the wrong road. He knew he had went to the wrong place. He knew it led to destruction, and he repented. In other words, he turned away from it. Sometimes people don't turn away from it. Well, you got to accept responsibility for the condition you're in. That's what he did. He says, Dad, I, I've sinned. He didn't blame his daddy for his mistakes. He didn't blame his brother for his mistakes or his mama. He, he, he wasn't out there. He knew that he had done it to himself. He was guilty. But he had enough sense to say, Lord... I've sinned against you. Let me be one of your servants, Dad. I, I, I don't need no special thing. Just let me be a servant. He had an attitude adjustment. And he did it. He, he went from being a parasite that took all the time, and he started his journey from, from being the give me to the place of, I want to be a servant. See, that's the difference. You can be in a far country, and you can stay a tick, or you can let go, and you can be a giver. You can be someone who makes a difference. You can be someone who the Father accepts and welcomes back home. The Father has waited in agony and prayer day after day. Won't you come home? That's what the old song says. Let me ask you, what about you? How long are you going to stay out there? When are you going to come home? When are you going to quit playing and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and come home? Do what God wants you to do and let God bless you. As Brother Raymond and them come down. They're going to play an altar call song. These altars are open. Don't matter if you're visiting, you're a member, you're 112, whatever age you are. Here's the difference. How will you respond.
That's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference. The father waited and said, Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Are you tired? Maybe you don't feel physically tired, but you're spiritually wore out. Won't you come home? The cross upon <coughs> Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And His grace so free is sufficient for me. And deep is this fountain as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend, have turned from the sins they have sinned. The Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for you. cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Brother Mike, would you dismiss us in prayer?